students know about Dr. King only in a very superficial way. And um, I, I very often say that, you know, they recognize his name. Uh, they know that there's a holiday for him. And they know that he had a dream. That's about it. <laughs> um, but uh, the idea that his work involved a really serious commitment to nonviolence and that nonviolence is not something you can adopt in an instant, something that has to be learned. Um, uh, that is not widely known. And uh, it needs to be taught and, uh, and we, and a person can have a lot of fun learning about nonviolence because it's like, um, it's like the discovery of a whole lot of new things that you immediately recognize are very important to you. They're very close to the heart. <laughs> and, um, uh, but it, it, in the next instant, it makes you wonder, why haven't I ever heard these things before? Why, why didn't my teachers tell me this stuff when I was in school years ago? Uh, first of all, any data that we have comparing violent approaches with nonviolent approaches suggests that, um, get ready for this, violent approaches are more dangerous. <laughs> and uh, uh, yet people are afraid of nonviolence because they are afraid that somehow that makes them more vulnerable. And um, in, in my way of thinking about nonviolence, that's uh, very much not true. Uh, nonviolence, gives you a new repertoire to add to the repertoire of skills and behavior and things that you know that you already have. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't take away your capacity for violence. If, if you're afraid that someone's gonna prevent you from being violent, well, nobody can really do that. Uh, you can be as violent as you want. Um, and it's your choice. But I think when a person learns nonviolence, they learn that choosing violence is like choosing to fail. It's, uh, it, there are always better options, especially if we make good use of time and if we are proactive and set up conditions in which uh, violence is probably not going to threaten us. I think when, when I and uh, other teachers of nonviolence and, and related disciplines that come under different names, um, when we're teaching, we are inoculating. We are, we are vaccinating our students, hopefully, yeah. against uh, future violence. And uh, like other kinds of prevention, it's very difficult to measure the effects of that. Well, violence has an advantage because it is aided by impulse. And impulse is very fast. Uh, it's one of the types of thinking that um, my colleague Daniel Kahneman has written about in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He says that in co human cognition, there are two systems, but uh, one is faster than the other. And um, in some ways, they, uh, they perform complementary functions. Uh, but um, nonviolence needs the, uh, the, the depth and the complexity of the slow system. And um, uh, nonviolence education has to work there. Eventually, it will produce quicker nonviolent responses to compete with impulsive, violent responses, but that takes time. You know, everybody wants to reserve the right to be violent to themselves. It's, and uh, again, it's one of those things that's sort of silly because nobody can take away the ability to be violent from a person. You know, that's, nobody can do that. I can't do that. The Mahatma can't do that, but, um, 
uh, we have this sort of logical conundrum. I think everybody in the world wants everybody else to be nonviolent. Um, but if there's still a lot of violence, what does that mean? It means that there are some people who are really holding onto it. So violence does terrible damage, first and foremost, to the person who is violent. And I think that's one of the strongest reasons to teach people how not to engage in it. Mm -hmm.